today. Uh, my name is Josh Bury, and I am uh, work for Adobe. I'm a computer scientist on the Camera Raw team. Um, also joining me are Alan Erickson. Um, Alan is also a computer senior computer scientist at Adobe, and um, Michael Shane Blum. He's a photographer and filmmaker uh, joining us from Santa Barbara. Uh, welcome. Thank you. Uh, I'll tell you Thanks. a little bit about myself first, and then we'll uh, introduce Alan and and Michael, I, I like to do a lot of astrophotography just as a hobby. Um, I have a small home observatory. I like to shoot, you know, close-up views of the sky, but I also enjoy, you know, landscape, more landscape-type astrophotography. Um, Michael, you want to share a little bit about uh, the types of astrophotography you enjoy? Sure. Um, I shoot uh, mostly wide-field astrophotography, a lot of panoramas, um, just really wide shots, and this came from me doing a lot of uh, time time lapse photography. You know, I would shoot time lapses of the stars, and then I would take pictures of the stars. So it's kind of where it came from. Oh, cool. And Alan, how about you? Sure. So, uh, uh, like Josh, I uh, do uh, photography uh, a little more, uh, I guess, uh, magnified, uh, detailed with a telescope. Um, and uh, it's a very deep hobby, and so I've been well occupied just getting, you know, all the moving parts to work well. And um, the aspect of wide field uh, photography, uh, and you know, to incorporate landscape and sky is a new thing to me. But I am starting to dabble uh, in that a little bit, and uh, it's it's fun. Okay. Uh, well, uh, we've got a lot to to cover here, so uh, maybe we should just jump right in. You know, what we want to do is talk a little bit about, um, you know, how do you get started in, in doing, you know, this kind of, especially this kind of wide field astrophotography. Um, it requires the least amount of equipment, and, um, you know, that's what we want to start with is what, you know, what kind of equipment do we use to um, to capture the sky? Uh, Michael, what, uh, what do you shoot with? What kind of tools do you use when you're out in the field? Um. You know, obviously a camera with high ISO capabilities, so something like a Canon 5D Mark III, or I actually use now a uh, Canon 6D, which I find is a little better. Um, you know, a good full-frame camera. And then um, a good wide lens, you know, anywhere from 14 to, you know, 24 millimeters that also has the capability of going down to... Um, f 2.8 to let in as much light as possible. I mean, other than that, just a tripod and and uh, you're pretty much good to go. Okay, yeah, I, I shoot with a similar setup. Although I'm I'm Nikon, you know, so I've got the Nikon D700 um, digital SLR, and you know, one of the things that makes this type of astrophotography easier with digital SLRs is you have all that full manual control. You know, you can set everything up, you can do long exposures. Um, and one, one little piece of equipment that I always have with me too, in addition to the camera, tripod, um, and lens is a, a cable release. I've got one here for my Nikon camera. This is really great because, uh, you know, sometimes you want to do really long exposures, longer than 30 seconds, and that lets you lock the shutter open. Um, so it's another, another little piece of hardware that can come in handy with that sort yeah. of photography. Yeah, cable releases are always good. Um, in addition to that, even an intervalometer, in case you wanted to do any sort of star stacking shots and you needed the camera to trigger, you know, every 20 or every 30 seconds, uh, intervalometer would also help. Yeah, definitely. Um, some cameras have it built in, but they tend to be not as uh, flexible as an external intervalometer. Yeah, agreed. So when I uh, started, uh, you know, putting a DSLR on my telescope, um, I used uh, a laptop and tethered. Um, at that time, it was just EOS Utility uh, to sequence the shots. Um, uh, Michael, do you uh, shoot tethered? Um, I don't, actually. I haven't really had the need to. I used to shoot some studio photography, and in that case, I would usually tether so that I could look at everything on a screen. Um, but... For the astrophotography, I mostly just take the camera out in the field. It's a little tough for me to um, bring a laptop some of the places I go, um, you know, every night. But 
I can see where it would be really handy for any deep space photography. Yeah, it's it's nice sometimes, you know, one of the challenges of being out in the field with a camera with astrophotography is, you know, generally, you know, you can't use your autofocus on your camera, but you you really need sharp focus, otherwise you can, you know, you can tell, especially with the stars, you get a really soft image. Uh, Michael, how do you how do you get sharp focus when you're out shooting at night? Yeah, so um, how I do it, which I think is probably the best method, is um, you know I will basically set the camera to manual, and um, I'll go in with live view and turn up the settings to make the ISO as high as possible. You know, so you're seeing all the grain, but you're seeing all the light come through. And then I find like a either a really far light in the distance, you know, like really far miles away, or um, I will find the brightest star, and I'll focus on that. And you know, sometimes it'll take one or two tries. You know, I'll look at the picture. Maybe it's slightly soft, but you know, I usually just twist the knob slightly. If it got softer, then I went the wrong way. You know, go two notches the other way, and you're pretty much in focus. And I've found that, you know, a lot of people uh, will set their camera to infinity. I've found that that does not work. It varies lens to lens, and um, it won't really give you uh, sharp focus. Yeah, right. your caveat, yeah, I found that too. Uh, sorry, your caveat about infinity is, is correct. Uh, do you have a swivel back on your camera to make it easier to see the live view on the camera? I don't um, like a like a view piece for it. Uh, well, some models, um, I think some models have a hinged back to oh, okay. to swivel, or do yeah, you use a or do you use a right angle attachment on the viewfinder? I don't actually. I just um, look straight at the screen and. Uh, I found that on the Mark III, it's a little easier. The, the screen on the Mark III is slightly brighter than the 6D, but that might just be a setting thing. Um, I've been able to just look at the back of the LCD screen and, and see everything perfect, but um, I'm not sure if you know that's the same for different cameras. So I seem to get into next strain. <laughs> You know, yeah, especially if you're hooked up to a telescope, that the camera could be way down close to the ground. You got to lay on the ground to see the uh, <laughs> screen. Yeah. I know I've done that before. Um, I've got a, a few uh, things to share here. Um, let's see. Uh, uh, you can see my screen. Um, <laughs> this is my Canon 1000D, and I modified it to make it more sensitive to red. And this is not for the faint of heart. <laughs> uh, it doesn't look like it. Yeah, and you you can you can hire this done. So I don't I don't recommend that. So, um, <laughs> and you know here's in the context of attaching it to a telescope, and the camera is on there somewhere. Um, here you can see it attached. Um, so this is just to show kind of where I'm coming from in the hobby, um, but. Where I'm wanting to go next is a tracking mount um, because I'm so used to tracking. I guess I this is kind of my transition into the camera lens and wide field uh, landscape uh, part. Um, and there's a few models or a few uh, companies that make these um, tracking mounts that are reasonably priced and and they they are meant to go on a good sturdy camera tripod and um, and you can use a ball head on there, and then uh, you just uh, you look through that little scope that you can see on there and line it up with a North Star, and just plug it in and let it run. Or you don't have to plug it in; you can run it on batteries, um, and it will just uh, rotate according to the sky. Real, actually, the Earth's rotation. Um, yeah, that's that, this it. way. You, this way, you can get to longer exposures. Yeah, and that's a good point. Actually, that's one of the other challenges we face, you know, as, on trying to image the sky is that it's always moving. You know, the Earth doesn't stop turning, so you're you're shooting something long exposure, but it's a, also a moving subject. Um, you know, so you kind of have to properly manage your exposure. Um, 
Michael, maybe you can tell us a little bit about how you, you know, you go out, it sounds like you like to shoot wide open at 2.8, um, mm -hmm. but otherwise, how do you determine your exposure, you know, based on, you know, what focal length they're shooting and all the, the moving sky factor? Yeah. Um, well, first of all, uh, about the tracking mount, I that's my next investment for sure is a tracking mount. That's an awesome um, way of shooting astrophotography, especially wide field. Um, as far as me doing exposures, um, most of the time I shoot when there's no moon. Um, and the sky, unless I'm in you know heavy light pollution, it stays pretty consistent. So what I usually do is at a base exposure, which I think this is you know, the base for most, you know, if most beginners are getting into astrophotography, this is the settings that would be 30-second um, exposure, f2.8 at ISO 3200. So usually I'll do a shot like that, and then, you know, depending on if I'm using my 20-millimeter lens or my 14-millimeter lens, I might, you know, go to 20 seconds to get a little less star blur and get everything looking a little sharper. Um... You know, I, I haven't had to stray too far away from those settings. Sometimes I do ISO 6400 because the foreground will just be pitch black and I need a little bit uh, more of it, you know. And in the case of it being too black, sometimes I'll just have to do some light painting. But uh, exposure settings is pretty close to the standard of, you know, 30 seconds, 2.8, uh, ISO 3200. Yeah, that's that sounds about what I. Uh, that's my starting point too. And uh, you know, one of the things uh, you know, a good tip for um, I learned this on the the other side of astrophotography where you're shooting at long focal lengths. But you know, you, to get the best picture when you're processing, you need a really good signal to noise in the image that you acquire. And one way of making sure you kind of maximize signal to noise is make sure that that the whole sky background is is actually exposed and one way to check that is just to look at the histogram on your camera and you'll see a big mountain and that's that big dark background you know you want to check and make sure that's a little bit separated from the the lower end of the histogram and that'll give you the best kind of data for you know processing later on yeah. but I usually use that to guide my exposures as well yeah okay um, I'll see another little kind of equipment, you know, field tip. I, sometimes I bring along with me a, um, a softening filter to use on my lens. And what that does is it, it kind of allows the brighter stars to kind of uh, expand a little bit in the photo. And it makes it easier to see, tell the difference between the brighter stars and the fainter stars in the image. So it's really great for um, shooting, like, constellations where you really want to see the the constellation stars, and it also helps bring out star colors, too, by diffusing some of the light. Um, cool. What yeah, is this called that, again? It's like a, um, it's, I think they're called softening filters, and okay, cool. It kind of, it's kind of like, if you use it in the daytime, it gives a photo kind of like a glowy, dreamy type effect, um, like a but when you use it on the stars, what's that? Like a diffuse, like making everything a little diffused? Yeah. Okay, Yeah, cool. it doesn't take much. Um, Josh, in fact, I can. In that case, is it working out in a single exposure um, that you get the effect that you want? It's not too much. Yes. Um, I usually experiment this. I have a set of filters, and there's five different strengths, and I usually stick with the the lower ones, but. You know, you can you can always. I usually hold the filter in front of the lens during the photo, and you can certainly just hold it over for part of the photo um, to get different amounts of softening. I'll show you an example um, of what this looks like in a picture. This is a shot of the Milky Way from Eastern Oregon, and uh, the exposure was a little bit long for the focal length, so the stars are trailing. But what I really want to show here is how. Uh, the Scorpius constellation in the foreground on the right there, you can really, it's bright stars really stand out from the background, and I was able to really enhance, maybe a little too much in this case, but really enhance the colors that the stars have. So that's that's what the softening filter does. It doesn't really affect the faint stars, but it, the bright stars really glow a lot more. Yeah, it looks great. So 
So, um, you know, another thing, you know, when you're in the field, oftentimes you, you want the stars to trail, you know, and that's another type of, you know, astrophotography is um, actually capturing that movement of the sky. Um, that's another another case where the cable release comes in handy because then you can lock the shutter open for 20 minutes or more um, to get that really long exposure. Uh, Michael, do you ever shoot star trails? You know, I, I I stopped shooting star trails for a while, and I actually recently got back into it. Um, I did a few exposures, um, you know, out here in San Diego, and um, you know, I was experimenting with some um, star trails, looking at Polaris, you know, with the full circle, and then I also did some smaller star trails where you were looking at the Milky Way, um, and you see the trail, and then I would blend the Milky Way image with the trail so you'd see the Milky Way really crisp and then around it would be blurred stars. Um, I actually have a really good tip for shooting uh, star trails. So obviously you're shooting star trails, generally you're going to get planes going through the shots and you know most people's first reaction to that would be well I'll Photoshop it out once the star trail is actually produced and you know, the more stars you have, the more difficult that can be. You start realizing going in and cloning it is almost impossible. Um, and I realized it's super easy to go through and just make, uh, you know, take your raw files and maybe make TIFF files in Photoshop and then just clone each light streak out, you know, of the planes individually and then process the star trail and then they're all gone. Um, so if anyone wants to get into star trailing and you're using stacked images, uh, it's super easy to go through and do it before you actually make the trail. Yeah, that's a good that's a good tip. I discovered that at, at some point uh, late, you know, unfortunately. But yeah, uh, that's one way to shoot star trails is using the intervalometer, like you talked about, and just taking a series of pictures and then you can stack those together either using um, there's a free kind of star trails desktop application that will do that and you star can stacks. also use layers in Photoshop yeah I um, you know I have done some longer star trails with just one exposure and, and um, I realized I, I feel like you get a cleaner picture when you just do shorter exposures and do the stack the stacking with light and blend mode um, mm -hmm. or use star stacks I, I find that the image comes out cleaner. Maybe if there's an image where a car, you know, a car's headlights flared out the lens, you can take that frame out, uh, which is super helpful for star trails. Because mm -hmm. I find, you know, you'll be shooting for like four hours and then, you know, maybe <laughs> you'll be ready to shut the camera off and as you're walking to go shut the camera off, a car comes out and, you know, big headlights and flares out the frame and then those like five hours are wasted. Right, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so yeah, another... Uh, oh, sorry, go ahead, with the short exposures uh, on star trails and then combining those, do you have problems with gapping? I, well, my, when your interval is only one second and you're shooting 30 second exposures, I don't find that there's barely any gap. The only issue is if the camera or tripod is knocked or if maybe your card, um, you know, there's some issues with the card where you'll get a like one photo gap. The only time where there is gap is when you need to take out an image with a bunch of flare. Um, I think Star Stacks actually has a pretty good setting in the program where it can find some of the gaps and sort of fill those in. Um, mm -hmm. I had gaps in one of mine where all I did was go through and do like a three pixel size clone and just, you know, go through streaks, and, and it wor actually worked out pretty well. Um, stacking, or uh, uh, gaps actually haven't been that much of an issue for me in, in processing that way. I was working with a Photoshop customer who was taking some nice star trails, and he was doing the multiple exposure approach. And it makes me wonder if he was tethered and maybe the extra little bit of time in a download in between each shot was getting in the way. I'm not sure, but that would argue for uh, just shooting on the camera card and not having a download in between to try to would, shorten up that time I would agree with that. as much yeah. as possible. Yeah, I find that any any more than one second between exposures will really show up uh, 
in the final photo. But yeah, that is a challenge. And also, like Michael said, you don't want to bump the tripod or touch anything because that just, you know, all the rest of the stars trailed after that moment will be an offset. Yeah. Yeah, so anyway, that's another kind of fun thing you can do with just your camera and a tripod, basically. Um, one final tip I might have before we get out of the uh, equipment discussions is um, I always bring lots of batteries with me because taking long exposures of the sky tends to uh, tends to burn through batteries pretty quickly. It requires power to keep the shutter open with you know modern cameras, and so uh, having extra batteries really helps. Agreed. Yeah, I have about seven just because I'm shooting time lapse, so it's oh, really right. needed. Um, I have a few more tips for people, I guess, uh, getting into astrophotography. So a lot of people always ask me, well, how do I find the Milky Way? Um, you know, how do I find it? I don't know how to find it. I don't know where to go. Uh, there's a few things, a few different apps that will help you in this way. Um, the first one's called Star Starwalk. I know there's other apps that do this also, but Starwalk is an app that, one, will tell you when the moon's going to rise, when it's going to set. It'll give you the moon phase um, for any day. You know, you can search a year from now, and it'll tell you what's going to happen. It gives you sunrise, sunset. Uh, tells you, you know, where the North Star is, where all the constellations are, and it also tells you where the Milky Way is going to rise, where it's going to set, and where it is in the sky, you know, in your current position. This is a an app, I believe, for iPhones, I think you can get it for an iPad too, but this app is amazing if you're like, you know, you're going out into the middle of a national park and you have no clue what to do, you have no clue where the Milky Way is going to be, this app is um, perfect. And then the other app that I recommend, actually it's not an app, it's just a website, uh, is called Dark Sky Finder, I think if you just type it into Google. Mm. You know, for a lot of people, they're wondering, well how do you get to such dark places um, luckily, in California, it's pretty easy. You know, you just go away from the city and you're in pretty dark sky. But I know for a lot of people in other countries, that this can be kind of a hard thing to do. Um, so Dark Sky Finder can be a good way of figuring out what areas, um, you know, might be darker than others. And all, people also have the ability to set dark sky points. You know, if they go somewhere, they can be like, this place was dark. And then it'll ha there, there'll be like a point uh, that somebody makes. Um, and then other than that, for people wanting to find dark sky, I recommend Googling your city or your, you know, state or wherever you are, and then after it, type in Milky Way or astrophotography. Chances are somebody in your city or in your area has tried astrophotography before, and this is a really good way of figuring out if something like that is going to work for you. Oh, cool. Yeah, those are great tools. I really like uh, Starwalk. I use that a lot. Another um, another really nice uh, tool, uh, an app is called um, Photo Pills. I think is what it's called, and it has some great tools for composing your shot, knowing where the Milky Way is going to be. It's got calculators for star trails for time lapse. Um, cool. Yeah, it's just another uh, another great tool out there. It's, it's nice that we live in an age with so many so many great tools available to us. Yeah, it would be a shame not to use them, you know. Right. Um, on uh, the on the topic of software, um, I I do continue to shoot tethered, um, even when I just use my little camera tracking mount. And uh, Backyard EOS is a nice app that uh, helps with the live view uh, and focusing on a star and the sequencing of the shots. Um, so I'm liking that. Cool. And on the topic of star trails, um, uh, people would have links uh, to uh, uh, Josh's uh, photo site. Um, if you don't have it handy, Josh, you have that awesome uh, star trail shot that you took where I put Polaris off into the upper left and the natural lens distortion uh, change the star trails into more of an ellipse than a circle, and it uh, that and the rest of the composition with the landscape, it was just beautiful. Oh, In fact, it you. was the astronomy picture of the day. <laughs> oh wow! Yeah, that was pretty fun. Yeah, well, um, in, a, in a little bit, we'll um, share some of our photos, and I'll uh, I'll show that one okay. for sure. 
I'll find a nice star trail, an old star trail of mine to show to. <laughs> cool. Well, uh, how about we just move on um, and talk a little bit about you know what we do once we're you know back at home, back in the in the the warm you know climate control, and uh, we want to start working on our photos and you know bringing them to the to the point where we want to post them and share them. Uh, Michael, maybe you can just kind of talk a little bit about your workflow. You know, when you when you get back home, what do you uh, what do you do with your photos? Yeah. So first thing, obviously, you know, I will go through and um, put them in my Lightroom catalog. Um, you know, and I'll star. I'll give one star to the images that I'm you know thinking will look good eventually. Um, and you know, I I back everything up right away just to make sure, you know, because I don't want to lose any of those images that I took hours to create. So, um, yeah, you know, I do the backups, and I go through uh, the Lightroom develop module and, you know, do some basic editing. I add a little bit of contrast. Um, I add a lot of noise reduction. I always color correct the sky, you know, neutralizing the sky. I usually click a point, not uh, a little offset from the Milky Way where, you know, generally... When I take the images in tungsten, it'll be super blue, and I'll click that so it kind of neutralizes everything, and then go through the uh, temperature sliders, kind of, um, you know, tweak those because you know a sky for every night is different. Um, other than that, you know, I I do use the gradient tool a little bit, especially if I have foreground that I'm trying to bring up. I'll use the gradient tool. Um, I'll use you know some shadows. Uh, the black and white sliders. I use every slider, it seems like. Um, what else do I do? Um, and then brush brush tools, you know, if I need to bring up a little bit of clarity in the Milky Way or take down some of the clarity in the foreground. Uh, local brush tools, you know. I, I And then oftentimes from there I'll export an image into Photoshop to do final, you know, modifications. Like if there's still a little bit of noise, I'll go through and kind of um, brush that out. Um, you know, if I need to do any sort of tweaking of the color that requires more than just moving the sliders, I'll I'll tweak that in Photoshop and then save a uh, a nice JPEG with a watermark and post that online. Oh, cool. Now, when you're shooting uh, time lapse sequences, do you do you bring those into Lightroom and and maybe edit one frame and synchronize the settings? Is that? Yeah, yeah. I I for most night sequences that works out really well. Is to just you know edit one frame, make sure it's perfect, sync the settings, save the metadata, and then I bring raw files into After Effects for okay. processing time lapses. Um, there's also a good program out there called LR Time Lapse, where if you're starting to see, you know, this gets a little complicated, but I'll just briefly describe it. You know, if you're seeing changes in the photo, you know, over time, maybe the sky cast becomes a different color, or you know, the exposure is changing. Um, LR Time Lapse is a program that will that can interpolate frames in between the first and last frame, or you can keyframe it and set the, the frames that you're going to edit. So basically you edit two frames, and then LR time-lapse will gradate every frame in between. And oh, cool. It's a really great program. Um, it's free for personal use, and then, or no, it's free for trial. Uh, I can't remember how much it is for personal use, and then there's a pro use as well. Michael, yeah, could you nice. talk a little bit, Michael, could you talk a little bit about fixing uh, gradients uh, within the image where you get uneven color casts, especially at, over such wide fields? Yeah, um, that's always an ongoing thing. Um, I find, you know, you know, oftentimes I can't go out to the most desolate locations where there's absolutely no light pollution. So, um, you know, with light pollution, I find that uh, using the highlight slider works pretty well. Just take down the highlights a little bit and uh, it can get rid of some of the light pollution. Um, as far as other ways of going through the sky, I will go through in Photoshop and I'll make a curves layer and then I'll, I'll mask that. You know, maybe, you know, if, if I, I'm seeing some patches in the sky 
that are brighter than others. I'll make a curves layer and slightly modify the curve. You can also do this in, you know, um, brightness and contrast or whatever you want to use. And, and just I go through the, the mask and I brush really softly with like, you know, 1% or 2% or 3% opacity. And I just brush constantly and, and make everything uh, fine tuned. And then for the color aspect of it, I use the same thing, the same method, but I'll use it on like a color layer or a hue and sat saturation layer. Um, How you about can do this. Lightroom? Oh, yeah. Um, same thing goes in Lightroom. I can use the brush tool and set um, a color cast or, or something like that. You know, like at the bottom there's the color box. I can set a, a, a slightly different color that looks more um, like the temperature I'm trying to achieve and then, you know, slowly uh, brush that in, brush that color back in. Yeah, and so, I mean, like the problem that you're seeing and I'm, I'm running into this as well is, uh, you know, a white balance for one part of the image doesn't work over the whole image. Uh, you know, you might have a a purplish cast in one region and a greenish cast in another. And these can be caused by light pollution. They can also be caused just by the upper atmosphere itself. Yeah. Air glow um, yeah, yeah, causes air a lot of that green cast that people try and remove from the images. And, I, you know, when I do the, the white balance, uh, the primary initial white balance for an image, I like to white balance the sky so that the Milky Way, you know, the galactic core starts to have those slight orange colors, and then the sky around it is, you know, it becomes a little warmer, but it's slightly blue, and then I'll go back in, and if I need to make the sky more blue, I'll make it a little bit more blue. But I like to see a little bit of those orange tones in the core. Nice. Well, thank you for sharing that. Um, you know, sometimes, too, I find that gradients from light pollution can actually add interest and color to a photo, you know, especially if you have, like, um, I was in Joshua Tree National Park shooting the sky, and it's close enough to Southern California where you get a pretty good glow on the western horizon, but it was kind of kind of nice because, you know, you could put these Joshua Trees silhouetted over the, the sky glow low to the horizon, and then you could still, you know, clearly see the Milky Way up above, and you can get some really nice shots that way. Yeah. Um, speak, speaking of nice shots, um, I'd like to see some of your uh, photos, Michael, if you are uh, if you want to share. Yeah, sure. You want me to... Um, okay, let's see here. I'll go ahead and screen share. Okay. Uh, can yeah, you see you the... Tell us a little bit about the shots and, you know, any any tips or anything um, as you go. That would be great. Yeah, sure. I'll go through them pretty quick, and then maybe I'll show, a, a, like, a little star trail or something. So um, here's a Galaxy Panorama. I, I think this one's 10 to 12 shots uh, shot at 20 millimeters. Um, I had a pretty high ISO on this one to get, you know, most of the foreground. I think my ISO was 6400. Um, but you know, when you're having an, you're, when you're having a panorama that's multiple images, that resolution, you know, grows a lot. Um, yeah, this shot took a lot of planning just to make sure the Milky Way was in the perfect spot, arching over the road. But uh, this has become one of my favorite um, compositions that I've shot so far. Um, that's beautiful. Thank you. Thanks. And, and uh, you know how the landscape is lit up as well. Yeah, and people always think it's multiple exposures, but um, well, I mean it is in the way of stitching, but you know, like it's an HDR, but you know, it's just a little bit of uh, the shadow slider and and you know, just bringing up those uh, those tones. Um, so yeah, that, that that one's one of my favorites. Um, this one's kind of a fun shot that I did. Um, it's a little heavy on the colors, but sometimes I like to go a little heavier than most people. Um, I this one is actually 
uh, there's a lone tree out in San Ynez that I found. I've been wanting to do this type of shot where it's just one tree silhouetted with the Milky Way. I've been wanting to do it ever since I started, and I finally found the right tree, and um, the galaxy was incredibly bright. Uh, the, the orange light pollution is from Los Angeles, which is about two and a half hours away. But other than that, the sky stayed pretty consistent, and it actually didn't take much to get this thing you know, looking uh, really bright, so. On saturation, um, you know, in the amateur astroimaging uh, field with telescopes, etc., the trend has been towards more saturation. Mm -hmm. um, and, of course, uh, the, the, the white balance and the, the, t the tints, you know, need to be well controlled or you'll get garish results, but this is beautiful. Thank you so mm -hmm. much. Thanks. Um, so here's another one. Um, this image uh, is a nice silhouette of these sculptures. They're actually sculptures of rams, uh, bighorn sheep, out in the Anza Borrego Desert. Um, they're they're huge metal sculptures, and um, you know I I found a nice angle for the Milky Way to be kind of in the middle. Um, this one actually didn't take much processing at all. This one's a little more subtle than the previous image. Um, the light pollution you're seeing is from Mexico um, and San Diego for the most part. Uh, did you use any planetarium software to plan that out? To no. Nah, was this image up. was kind of a wing it and go sort of situation and me just moving around the, you know, I, I actually anticipated that the Milky Way would be slightly more to the left and I, I was, you know, going to shoot the, the angle of the sheep where uh, it would be more of like a profile shot of both the sheep, but um, this actually turned out kind of nice where they're sort of at more of a diagonal angle. Um, kind of a fun shot. Um, anyone going to this spot, they'll watch out because there's really soft sand and you can get stuck. <laughs> um, so this one is shot um, at, let's see, I think it's um, Lake Cuyamaca in San Diego. Um, this one is a vertical panorama of about, uh, it's 14 millimeter shots, probably 20, 14 millimeter shots. However, they're heavily overlapped so that the program could, you know, figure out how to stitch them. And, um, yeah, you know, it's just a nice long exposure kind of pier with the Milky Way in the distance. So where the sky was concerned, did you have to kind of get through that fairly quickly, you know, to account for rotation? Yeah, you know, I found that if I take the image and they're 20 to 30 second exposures and I'm really quick about you know switching compositions for the next shot um, I have found that the programs don't have any problem with the fact that the sky is moving you know if you're waiting like five minutes obviously that sky is gonna move a lot or if you're shooting at millimeters that are a lot you know like 50 millimeters or something like that but um, I haven't had too much of an issue with it so far well, that's, those are some really awesome shots, uh, Michael. Um, so, you know, I'm not going to go over this one too much. It's basically um, my version two of the first shot with the road, except this one was more of like a desert road in the Ansa Borrego with a little brighter of a galaxy um, and, you know, the nice uh, glow of, I believe this is um, El Centro in the distance. Um uh, this one was a shot I did um, of my girlfriend's sister's friend. Um, we went out to the mountain and shot a few photos. I wanted to show them uh, the Milky Way. And, um, you know, I lit her with a headlamp uh, from behind to get the glow. Um, and then, you know, for a split second, lit her from the front. This is actually one exposure, and it, it uh, mm. didn't take much to get this image. Um, so there's that. Uh, here's a self-portrait of me, a black and white, at uh, Mobius Arch um, in Alabama Hills. I have my headlamp on to illuminate um, the rock, and uh, you know the headlamp kind of goes into the Milky Way. I just thought this one was kind of a fun black and white image. Um, 
And then, yeah, really quickly, I'll show you guys um, just uh, a star trail image. Let's see here. Find a good one. I guess that's a horse trail image. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was actually a shot um, at Rincon Beach. The horses uh, ride on the beach over there. It's kind of fun. Um, here's here's one of my uh, uh, star trail shots I was happier with. Um, this was up at Mount Laguna, and I lined up Polaris with the top of the radio dome kind of had some fun. Um, this one was, I believe, a 30-minute star trail um, using s the stacking method that we talked about. And, you know, I heavily increased the saturation to give it kind of, you know, this isn't supposed to really be a realistic image. It's not supposed to, you know, showcase any scientific thing. You know, I just, this is more coming from the artistic side of it, just, you know, expressing uh, my creativity and trying to make a beautiful image. Oh, very cool. Thank you for sharing this. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Alan, do you want to show us a couple of your, uh, your sure. longer focal length shots that you have? Yeah. So I'm just sharing now. Okay, so I showed a, uh, you know pictures before of the uh, my Canon 1000D on my telescope. Uh, and on that imaging session, uh, I did a few hours of 10-minute exposures of this object. This is the Veil Nebula. It's, it's overhead uh, late summer. And uh, I showed a picture of my camera as I had it all torn apart because I was modifying it. And that was partly just for the geek factor, but the reason I modified it was I replaced a, a factory filter uh, with a filter that would allow more red light uh, to come through. And so the, this is a raw image that's got this real reddish cast. Um, the camera firmware doesn't realize it's been modified, and Lightroom doesn't realize the camera's been modified, so things will take on a reddish cast. But the white balance uh, will fix that right up. Mm. Um, so um, I picked out the best exposures. I ended up taking 15 of these uh, uh, through processing, and I set the white balance on each one. Uh, it didn't quite work to, uh, to just propagate all the settings. Um, because the white balance would be just a little different because of variations in the sky conditions over the few hours where I was taking these exposures. Looks great. Uh, yeah, what else about this? Um, then uh, I brought uh, those 15 images into Photoshop and uh, as layers and then used the auto-align. And the auto-align command is not really meant for star images. Uh, so often it will do a very good job, sometimes uh, not so much. Uh, in a pinch, you could manually uh, tweak the alignment, maybe with the free transform. Uh, and then, um, uh, so then once I had my 15 images all aligned, then I grouped them together into a smart object. And then smart objects uh, have some stacking capabilities and I used a mean combine, in other words just average them together and that uh, improved the signal to noise ratio a lot. Uh, this is the final result after um, working on the uh, color balance and the saturation. Um, so that's oh, it. For that. Yeah, so this, this, this was a shot at 720 millimeter focal length on that telescope and the image occupies the space of about two widths of the full moon. Oh, so pretty narrow view, huh? Well, cool. Well, maybe I'll, uh, we just have a few minutes left here. Uh, I'll show a couple of, of my shots um, just to get some more variety in here. And then, um, yeah, then we'll wrap it up. So let me uh, switch over to Lightroom. Uh, so this is this is a shot up in the up in the wilderness in the central Oregon. Um, it's kind of like some of Michael's shots where I, I had to take multiple exposures and stitch them together using the Pano Merge tool in Photoshop. Uh, one of the things I really like about this shot is 
it was taken right at, towards the end of what's called blue hour, which is kind of after sunset, but the sky still has a blue color. It's just you don't notice it with your eye, but the camera can see it. And so off on the right, you see the last last glow of sunset, and then 180 degrees over to the east on the left um, is actually the moon just starting to rise. That's actually a glow from the moon, not from a distant city. Wow. And then right in the middle is uh, Jupiter, actually. And I was using a softening filter, so really Jupiter really got, you know, the, the size of it in the actual photo increased a lot, but you can really see how bright it was compared to the surrounding stars. Yeah, it's really um, cool. Yeah, thank you. Uh, here's kind of what we were talking about earlier, where this is just a single 20-minute exposure, and you can kind of see that that movement of the sky, um, but really just camera on tripod with this uh, cable release. And then and you can, of course, go longer. This is a couple hours longer, uh, probably, well, probably an hour and a half, I think. And this one was a bunch of 30-second exposures that I stacked later and actually managed to catch a, shoot, a meteor shooting star um, during one of them, so that was kind of neat. And here's a much longer one. This is about six hours, um, which here in uh, Oregon, where I'm at, is about how much darkness we get every night. So uh, the challenge here was I was up uh, up away from power source, and my, there was no way my battery and my camera was going to last that long. So um, I ended up getting an AC adapter and a, borrowing a generator to uh, power the camera throughout the night so I didn't have to touch it to change batteries, but um, but yeah, I was pretty happy with it. Um, and this is the one Alan was speaking of that has the elliptical uh, trails from the lens distortion. Yeah, it looks really cool. Let's see what else we got here. This is another uh, blue hour shot from out in eastern Oregon. Um, It's a longer focal length, but this was actually not long after sunset, so I was able to do a shorter exposure and not get any uh, trailing on the stars. This was a Joshua Tree? Yeah, this was out of Joshua Tree, just cool. after, not long after sunset. Um, and, you know, when you're standing there, you don't really see all these colors, but, um, you know, the, the low-light sensors in our eyes are just, uh, they don't see color, but the camera still can, so, you know... One of the things that's always worth it, and especially with astrophotography, is just to go out and experiment. You know, put the camera on the tripod and take a shot and see what you see. And uh, you know, sometimes there can be surprises. You know, in terms of what the camera picks up in the sky that you didn't first notice. Yeah. Uh, it's another one from Joshua Tree. I was just experimenting. You know, okay, well, I'm going to take my flashlight and run down the trail. You know, to see what happens. And uh, you know, it ended up being kind of a fun shot. This is, you know, similar to Alan's work. Um, I take this out of my observatory, um, long, much longer focal length, but um, and that's a, you know, a whole topic altogether, and has its own challenges. Um, anyway, we're uh, pretty much out of time here. Um, thank you, Alan, Michael, for joining us today, and everyone uh, that logged in to view the hangout. And um, yeah, that's it. Yeah. Thank you Have so good much day. for thanks so much for having me. It was an honor. Yeah, thank you for joining. I really appreciate yeah, your time you. today. Thank you, Josh and Michael. It was fun. Yeah, nice meeting you guys. Okay. Okay.